In the game of Yu-Gi-Oh, players will use the term tiers in order to describe how strong a deck is. And since tiers are basically a fan-made thing and not an official rating system, there is a lot of confusion about what the tiers actually mean. But the most commonly accepted one amongst the competitive community is the one devised by the Pojo forums a long time ago, where basically a deck's tier is described by how many topping decks appear in events. And if a deck takes more than 65% of top spots in big events, then it is considered a tier 0 deck. If a deck only takes 15 to 65% of top spots, however, then it is only a tier 1 deck. So, enough with that introduction. At number 5, we have Chaos Yata Lock. Back in 2004, Konami released the Chaos Support, which was basically a series of cards that required both light and dark attribute monsters in order to do things. One of those was Chaos Emperor Dragon Envoy of the End, a completely broken, overpowered card that had the same stat line as Blue Eyes White Dragon and could special summon itself from your hand by simply banishing one light and dark monster from your graveyard. And its effects allowed you to send all cards in both players' hands and on the field to the graveyard to inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card sent to the graveyard with its effect. There was also another card called Yantagarasu, who had the effect that if it inflict battle damage to your opponent, you could skip your opponent's next draw phase. So, what players would do is have either Sangan or Witch of the Black Forest on the field use Chaos Emperor Dragon's effect to send all cards on the field and in both players' hands to the graveyard, which would proc one of the two cards' floating effects, which would then allow you to add Yada Garasu from your deck to your hand. And then you'd simply normal summon the little bird, attack, and your opponent would be locked out of doing anything. As long as you attack with Yandagarasu once per turn, and your opponent had no cards in their hand, they could not break the lock, and they essentially would just lose the game. And prior to the Yada lock, Yu-Gi-Oh did not have any forbidden cards yet. They had a ban list, but they had only ever limited cards on it, and I think it was called the restricted list or something, where you could just play one copy per deck, but they hadn't actually banned a single card in the game yet. And yet so many people were playing the Yada Lock, at least 85% of top spots were taken by this combo, according to some of my sources, that Konami felt the need to ban cards for the first time. So both Yata Garasu and Chaos Emperor Dragon got banned, and were no longer allowed to be played in decks. And even after that, people still played Chaos decks like crazy, and it was even a Chaos deck that won the first ever World Championship in 2004. And it got to the point where every deck was basically a variation of Chaos decks. All 32 spots were taken by Chaos decks, so eventually they hit the remaining Chaos cards, namely Black Luster Soldier and Chaos Sorcerer, and they weren't released from the ban list for almost 10 years afterwards. Now, the power creep of the game has gotten to the point where this deck wouldn't be that good anymore, and could probably be defeated by any meta deck that exists in today's format. So that's why it's at the bottom of this list, the number 5 spot, even though Yantagarasu is still technically a banned card to this day. There are so many cards with graveyard effects that just getting rid of your opponent's hand wouldn't actually win you the duel anymore, and it's kind of been power crept a little bit. Although, fun fact, in a lot of the old Yu-Gi-Oh games, if you manage to pull off the Yada Lock, the AI is programmed to instantly surrender. And at number 4, we have Teledan. Teledan was a deck that revolved around Dark Arm Dragon, a card who has the effect where, if you control exactly three dark monsters in your graveyard, you can special summon this card from your hand. And it also has a not-once-per-turn effect, where you can banish one dark monster from your graveyard in order to destroy one card on the field. So, if you bring out Dark Arm Dragon, you should be able to destroy three cards immediately with its effect. However, the great thing about Dark Arm Dragon was that nothing about it was once per turn, including its summoning condition. So if you had three Dark Arm Dragons in your hand, you could bring them all out as long as you met the conditions of one of them, as you didn't actually have to remove any resources to bring the card out on the field. And then, as long as you could fill your graveyard up with Dark Monsters, you could destroy every card your opponent controls. And when Dark Arm Dragon came out, they had also released a whole bunch of Dark Support cards, and Destiny Heroes were seeing some success with a whole bunch of different kinds of decks, and they were all Dark-type monsters. So when Synchro Monsters came out, along with the new Psychic-type monsters, and a card called Emergency Teleport, which is a quick play spell card that lets you special summon any level 3 or lower Psychic-type monster from your deck, but it's banished here in the end phase. So, if you brought out Krebons, which is a level 2 dark Psychic-type monster, 
you could use it with one of your destiny heroes to go into synchro monsters. That would then give you two dark monsters in your graveyard immediately, and since the rest of the deck revolved around manipulating the cards in your graveyard and bringing back your banished monsters, you had a deck that could spit out level 6 and 8 synchro monsters pretty easily, including really good stuff like pre-nerf Goyo Guardian and Stardust Dragon, and the same deck that could also bring out Dark Arm Dragon, who could then clear your opponent's board of anything that might give you any problems, while also just gaining advantage from the Destiny Hero stuff, like Malicious bringing itself out from the graveyard, and a lot of the variants played Dark Lord Zerato, which allowed them to destroy even more monsters. It was just a deck that was able to both spam out good, big monsters, and also completely wipe your opponent's board selectively, and do all of this pretty quickly and consistently, since you could special summon your main combo pieces directly from your deck, thanks to Emergency Teleport. And Teledad decks were so good, basically everyone was playing it, and I don't have actual numbers on it, but it's very safe to assume that Teledad decks won more than 65% of top spots at most big events when it was still around. Basically, Teledad decks were so good and so commonly played that people were putting cards in their main deck specifically designed just to counter other Teledad decks. And Teledad decks basically defined what a tier 0 deck is, and was the first tier 0 deck in a somewhat modern format, where Yu-Gi-Oh started going towards more extra deck focus, rather than main deck monster focus like it had been for the entirety of its life up to that point. But like any deck that becomes tier 0, it eventually got destroyed by a ban list, where Dark Arm Dragon got limited to one copy instead of being banned. And surprisingly, none of the other main combo pieces got banned either. Emergency Teleport and Reinforcements of the Army got limited to one. Destiny Draw Malicious got both semi-limited to two. And that was about it. Although hitting five of the main combo pieces of the deck did severely drop the consistency of it especially the two hits to Dark Arm Dragon and Emergency Teleport, the two cards the deck basically revolved around. And the hits to Dark Arm Dragon are kind of a good example that they don't always need to ban cards in order to kill an overpowered deck, as Dark Arm Dragon never got banned and basically stayed at one copy for years, until recently where it's starting to be loosened off the ban list. And that's mainly because a full-powered Teledad deck probably couldn't compete with modern decks, and it definitely would not be able to defeat the next three spots on this list, as they are way more powerful than Teledad ever was. And at number three, we have Zodiacs. Zodiacs once took all top 32 spots at a YCS event in Pittsburgh in 2017, and I don't think a deck has ever really met that kind of representation ever since, in the modern format. But probably some of the early tier zero decks had a similar kind of representation, it's hard to get info on those, but Zodiac was a modern tier 0 deck, as it was only two years ago as of making this video, and easily took more than the 65% of top spots required, as it even took 100% of top spots in one major event. Now, the reason Zodiacs were played so heavily when they were still a thing is because they can be splashed into any other deck very easily, and acted as an excellent engine, similar to how dangerous are today. Although most of the decks they got splashed into used enough Zodiac cards that it was basically a half Zodiac deck anyway, and what the Zodiacs did that made them so good was they had this little gimmick where you could exceed summon any exceeds Zodiac monster using any Zodiac monster, including other exceeds Zodiac monsters. So if you could get out a single Zodiac, you could go into any Zodiac exceeds monster, and they had two really good ones that are currently banned. One of them was Zodiac Broadbull, that allowed you to detach one Exceeds material to search out any Beast Warrior type monster, which can be normal summoned or set from your deck, which was basically all of them and only excluded a few outliers. You can then immediately rank up Broadbull into Zodiac Dryden, who had the effect to destroy one face-up card in the field. And since this effect was spell speed 2, you could use it during your opponent's turn to disrupt plays. And being able to easily get out a spell speed 2 destruction effect like this is what made Zodiacs really good, because that's one of the best effects a card can have, and it's pretty rare for a monster to have spell speed 2 destruction effects like this. And also, Zodiac decks could search out Zodiac monsters real easily, and all of the Zodiac main deck monsters had extra effects where they would give the Exceeds monster they were materials to an extra effect. So Zodiac Rat Pier had the effect, where if it was an Exceeds material, of a Zodiac monster basically, 
You could have that Exceeds monster detach one of its materials to special summon another copy of Rat Peer from your hand or deck, who could then be used as the full material for any Zodiac Exceeds monster, who would then gain the effect to special summon another Rat Peer from your deck, since its effect was not a hard once per turn. So with a single Rat Peer, which could be special summoned directly from your deck with Zodiac Barrage, could get you four monsters on the field and an extra card in your hand without using your normal summon. Using Zodiac Red Peer's effect twice, and a Zodiac Tiger Mortar to special summon another Zodiac from the grave, and Zodiac Broadbolt adding a card to your hand from your deck. So a single Barrage could essentially allow you to go plus five, and that wasn't even the full potential of the deck. They even had combos that allowed them to special summon Coach King Giant Trainer to draw three cards, and they were the only meta deck that brought out Elder Entity Norden through Fusion Summoning, rather than just relying on Instant Fusion, using Fusion Substitute. But they also did use Instant Fusion as well. And Elder Entity Norden is already a broken card on its own. So the fact that it worked so well with Zodiacs just kind of gave it even more advantage. And I have to remind you, this archetype could easily get out all of this advantage, and they could start this combo with any Zodiac monster. It was one of the most hyper-consistent decks ever made, that also allowed you to get an insane amount of advantage, while playing nice with pretty much any other archetype you might want to throw in to support it. The only real limiting factor to Zodiacs was that their Exceeds monsters could only bring themselves out once per turn, using their effect to rank themselves up on top of any Zodiac monster. But you could bring them out again the old-fashioned way, and Zodiac decks would absolutely bring out Zodiac Broadbull multiple times per turn, because for some reason, its search effect was not a hard once per turn. And since they could get so much advantage on the field so easily, they could search out anything they wanted from their deck. And then Zodiac Whiptail allowed any Zodiac Exceeds monster to banish any monster it battled, which could be attached directly to the card from your hand during the battle phase. So it wasn't really safe to attack into any of the Exceeds monsters. So, what Konami finally did in order to stop everyone from using Zodiacs in every single deck was they limited Zodiac Rat Peer to one copy, which essentially killed the card because it means it has no effect when it's attached to a monster anymore, as it only works with other copies of itself. And then they banned Zodiac Broadbolt and Zodiac Dryden. And in the LCG, they went a step further and limited Zodiac Barrage as well. Or I think they banned it and then recently put it back to one copy. You know an archetype was good when they banned multiple copies of a card from the archetype. And currently, Zodiacs don't really see any play, since they hit all the cards that allowed them to gain a whole bunch of advantage, and they no longer have Spell Speed 2 Destruction, which turned out was a really good effect to the point where they don't really function without it. And full power Zodiacs would still be good even today with the new Link restrictions. If anything, I think they could probably be even better. But surprisingly, I think the top two spots are better than Zodiacs if they were to face off against each other at full power. Because what beats a deck that's hyper consistent and can go plus 5 easily? How about decks that can do the exact same thing, while also getting a whole bunch of negates on the board? And at number 2, we have Pepe. Pepe was the name given to Performer Pal Perform Mages, as the two archetypes worked together, and both started with P.E. Now, remember how Zodiacs could set up plus 5 combos with any card in their deck? Well, Pepe could basically do that as well, and it could use its advantage a little bit better, as they could consistently set up Cyber Dragon Infinity with the nature of Beast, and search out a couple of Solemn Strikes from their deck, all while going plus five or more. The Pepe deck had a card called Performa Pal Monkey Board, which was like a searcher for your searchers that could search out your other searchers. It was a one card pendulum setup, and when this card is placed on the scales, you can add a level four lower Performa Pal monster from your deck to your hand. So, if you set Monkey Board while you had Performer Pal Guitar Turtle, you could set up your scales while going plus two. And there were seven other cards that also allowed you to go plus off of their effects, with two of them allowing you to gain pluses off of activating the pluses of some of the other cards. And that's not even including Monkey Board or Guitar Turtle. So technically they had like nine searchers. And since this was during Master Rule 3, they could easily set up their extra deck with a whole bunch of monsters and then bring them out again for some extra deck plays. And easily bring out Teller Knight Tolmaius, who could rink up into Cyber Dragon Infinity. They could easily go into King of Feral Imps to search out X Saber Paler Muro, who could be used with Perform Mage Hat Tricker 
to synchro summon Nature a Beast, and in the OCG they still had access to Shockmaster, which they could easily go into with his deck, and with Guiding Ariandne, they could search out multiple copies of Solemn Strike during your turn, just by doing their plays like normal, as a lot of their cards allowed them to destroy Guiding Ariandne to proc its effect, since like 10 cards in the deck could search out the other cards, and then themselves be used as combo pieces to bring out negates, the deck was incredibly consistent and could shut down pretty much any deck if it went first, and could play through a few negates if it went second. The deck was so good that it called for an emergency ban list, where they then immediately banned Perform Mage Plushfire, which for some reason did not have a once per turn on its special summon from the deck effect, Perform Mage Damage Juggler, and Teller Knight Tomias. Then they limited Perform a Pal Skulker Bat Joker, Perform a Pal Monkey Board, and Luster Pendulum the Draco Slayer, where they eventually just banned Monkey Board and Joker as well. So immediately hitting 6 cards from the deck would kill just about anything, considering they completely destroyed Zodiacs by only hitting 3 cards. And to this day, some of these cards are still banned, even though Pepe isn't as effective with Lynx. Or maybe it could be even better, I don't know. They could get out so much advantage so easily that I'd assume they'd be able to use their advantage with Link monsters, especially with the much better Pendulum support that's been released since they've all been banned. And at number one, we have Spirals. Here's the funny thing about Spirals. They were tier zero in 2017, and Zodiacs were also tier zero in 2017. So 2017 was the only year to have two tier zero decks in it. And what's funny about Spirals being tier 0 is that they essentially had the entire archetype already released, and they weren't seeing very much competitive success. Then when Link Monsters got released, Konami started giving all of the archetypes their own Link-specific cards, and Spirals were given Spiral Double Helix, which was such a good card that it instantly shot Spirals to tier 0 status. And I even have some graphs from OCG events that show Spirals taking 69 and 91% of top spots at two separate events, so they easily qualify as a tier 0 deck. So what made Spirals tier 0? Well, kind of a combination of both Zodiacs and Pepe, where Spirals were hyper consistent, they could get out negates on the board, and also get out multiple monsters with spell speed 2 disruption during your opponent's turn. Because you see, Spirals have two cards called Spiral Quick Fix and Spiral Gear Drone that both have effects that basically allow you to go plus one, and both of these cards do not have hard ones per turns on these effects, and they're both also machine type monsters with less than 500 attack. So they're both targets for machine duplication that let you special summon two copies of them from the deck, each one being a potential plus one. They also have a field spell card that allows them to once per turn add any spiral monster from their deck to their hand, but it's only a soft once per turn. And they also have a card called Spiral Master Plan, which can add a spiral mission card from your deck to your hand, and if it's sent from the field to the graveyard, you can add the field spell card as well as any spiral monster from your deck to your hand. So it has the potential to allow you to go plus three with this effect. So how Spiral Double Helix allowed the strategy to become tier zero is because Double Helix allowed you to take any one Spiral monster from your deck or graveyard and then either add it to your hand or special summon it to a zone this card points to. So if you just special summon Spiral Master Plan directly from your deck, you could search out any Spiral monster, get the Spiral Field Spell card that allows you to search out another Spiral monster, and get a Link monster on the field as you had to send Spiral Master Plan to the graveyard to activate its double search effect. And since this was in the early days of Link Monsters, Firewall Dragon was still at three copies, which is currently a banned Link card for having a broken effect, where if a monster this card is pointing to goes to the graveyard, you can special summon a monster from your hand. So with Spiral Quick Fix's ability to special summon itself from the graveyard, Spiral's Super Agent's effect to special summon itself from your hand, and the crazy amount of searches you can get with the other Spiral Guards, you could easily bring out multiple copies of Firewall Dragon, have it co-linked with copies of Spiral Double Helix, as its link arrows were perfect for co-linking with Firewall Dragon, to then add more Spiral cards from your graveyard back to your hand with Firewall Dragon's other effect, where it could add monsters from the field or graveyard to your hand equal to the amount of monsters it's co-linked to. And Spirals also have another card called Spiral Sleeper, who's like the Zodiac Dryden to the Spiral archetype, 
where it can target one spiral card you control and two cards your opponent controls and then destroy those cards. So if you simply equip Sleeper with Spiral Gear Last Resort, Spiral Gear Last Resort makes it so it can't be destroyed by card effects. So Sleeper can just target itself with its own effect to destroy any two cards your opponent controls. And this destruction effect is spell speed too. So you could destroy two cards your opponent controls during your opponent's turn, instead of just one like Dryden could. And also, their field spell card, in addition to being able to surge out any card from their deck once per turn, also protected their spiral cards, as your opponent could not target your spiral cards for card effects while the field spell card was out. So with Spiral Sleeper on the field, equipped with Last Resort, and a Trigate Wizard triple co-linked with a Firewall Dragon, you'd have two quick effect disruption effects, as most spiral decks would go into a second Firewall Dragon in order to use its quick effect during your opponent's turn, as it can only be used one time while it's face up on the field. Then they'd have their Negate with Trigate Wizard, and a full hand of hand traps, as they would have gained an incredible amount of pluses with all the spiral cards going off. So eventually what they did was limit both Spiral Quick Fix and Spiral Gear Drone to one copy, so you can no longer benefit from the Sheen Duplication shenanigans, and they were much less consistent. They also banned Blackwing Gofu the Vague Shadow and Grinder Golem, which helped a lot with their link plays. They put Set Rotation to one copy, which was a nerf to their ability to search out their field spell card, and then they eventually limited Firewall Dragon to one copy, where it was then eventually banned like a year later. So surprisingly, having three of their main cards set to one copy was enough to reign in the deck, and it was no longer an overpowered tier zero consistency engine like it was, as it really needed quick fix, drone, and resort to be at multiple copies for it to do all of its shenanigans. Now, the reason I have Spirals at number one is because they have proven to be really good with Link monsters already, and they could set up their combos with basically any of their opening hands. So they had the hyper consistency that's basically required of tier zero decks, and they can also set up a board of negates and have even better protection with their field spell card. But honestly, I think a full power Pepe deck that's properly incorporated with link monsters could easily match spirals in some way, shape or form. It's just Pepe was barely tier zero, as I'm not 100% sure it even got the full 65% representation since it got banned so quickly. So we actually got to see Spiral shine a lot longer and got to see the full potential of an uncontested tier zero deck in the modern Link format. All right, and that's it for the video. I feel like I should mention a couple of other decks people will probably ask about. Dragon Rulers are a very popular deck that was really strong, but they were never tier zero because when Dragon Rollers were at full power, Spellbook of Judgment existed at the exact same time, which is probably one of the most broken cards in the game. And Dragon Rollers at full power, plus Spellbooks with Spellbook of Judgment, both competed with each other for top spots, and made sure that neither one of them could get the 65% showings that were required in order to become Tier 0. Even though both of those decks had the kind of power associated to Tier 0 decks, and both of them could probably match any of the other tier zero decks that I mentioned in this video, because they were just that good. But it was a case of them both coming out at the exact same time, and tiers are determined by results, and neither of those decks managed to get enough topping decks to qualify for tier zero. Even when Spellbook of Judgment got banned, and Dragon Rollers weren't hit as hard, they still weren't tier zero. Dragon Rollers won basically all of the events, but they did not have 65% representation or more. They had like 35% or something. And that's why all the Dragon Rulers eventually got banned, because they kept winning everything. And if you've made it this far in the video, that means you probably liked it to some extent. So if you want to see more videos just like this one, you should probably subscribe to be notified when future videos come out.